Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us for the third in a series of four webinars exploring the impact of debt on working families. This series is part of the Southern Partnership to Reduce Debt Initiative, launched by the Annie E. Casey Foundation in 2017. The SBRD is a network of organizations, including Prosperity Now, that have come together to improve the financial security for communities of color in the South by helping to reduce levels of harmful debt. This webinar is focused on the financial insecurity caused by student loan debt and solutions to alleviate these burdens. Um, so this it should go for about an hour and a half and it's entitled Addressing Student Loan Debt, Federal, State, and Institutional Solutions and the Impact of COVID-19. Next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we dive into the substance. Uh, please know that this is being recorded um, and it should be uh, ready for folks to listen to online within a week. Um, all of the folks that are uh, participating as audience members are muted while the speakers are, are speaking. Um, and I think most importantly, if you have any questions uh, during the presentation that you'd like to ask our speakers, please feel free to share those in um, the control panel box to the right. Uh, and uh, if we have time, we will definitely make sure to ask those questions of your speakers. Uh, next slide. Uh, so Prosperity Now's mission is to ensure that everyone in our country has a clear path to financial stability, wealth and prosperity. Uh, and the SBRD initiative uh, is certainly a part of our mission. Next slide. Uh, so again, uh, before we dive into the substance, uh, just a little bit of uh, agenda setting for us. Um, we're gonna start, after I introduce the speakers, uh, we're gonna start with a presentation on um, some findings from a report that the Aspen Institute released earlier in the year on state solutions to student loan debt. Uh, we'll then follow that by uh, having a discussion about what Texas is doing um, to address issues of student loan debt uh, in the state of Texas. Um, we'll then follow that with uh, a discussion about institutional solutions or what you know, universities uh, should be doing when it comes to risk sharing and the like when it comes to issues of, um, of student loan debt. Um, we'll follow that just with next steps uh, and some opportunities for advocacy. Next slide. Tufa, I think there, the slide is not going. Oh, there we go. Um, yeah, okay, so just to, you know, to get you guys in the participant mood, um, while the other uh, speakers are doing their presentations, if you could share with us, in addition to your questions, um, you just let us know how student loan debt is impacting the low income individuals and families in your communities. Um, so in addition to questions, I can share that with the speakers as well. I'm sure they would like to know what's going on uh, in your neighborhoods uh, and the kinds of challenges is, that you're facing right now. Uh, next slide. Uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it on to our first speaker. This is Tim Shaw from the Aspen Institute, and he's going to be sharing insights from his report. Thanks so much, Tim. Thank you. And I want to thank Prosperity Now for holding this event, and also the NE Casey Foundation, the Southern Partnership to Reduce Debt, for supporting all this work. Um, our work as, as a part of that effort. Um, it's been really um, a really important piece of what we do at the Financial Security Program at the Aspen Institute. So. Uh, I'm going to go into a little bit of our perspective first and just introduce kind of who we are to the audience and then dig into the um, specifics around our report on state student debt. So next slide, please. And the next one. So uh, briefly about uh, the Aspen Institute Financial Security Program, um, we take a look at policy and markets from the perspective of household financial security. Um, we believe that, we're, uh, that by taking a holistic view of the financial picture of households leads to really clear insights about 
how to design policies um, and markets in such a way that actually leads to um, prosperity for everyone. Uh, we, our kind of long-term vision is that financial security should be taken just as seri seriously as national security because it has that, those sorts of real life and death implications that national security does. And so all our work comes from that kind of household perspective. Uh, next slide, please. So entering into this work on student loan debt, um, we, I want to ground us in kind of where households are as we start to talk about this very particular problem that households face. I think it's important to say and acknowledge that obviously COVID-19 and the impacts of the economic impacts of it beyond even the, the obvious health impacts have been really detrimental for households. But um, it's also true that households, even after the longest economic recovery in history, weren't doing great. Um, leading into the pandemic, only about one in three Americans were considered financially healthy, according to the Financial Health Network and CFPB's financial well-being scores. 40% got by of households got by on $33,000 or less. There's an age-old stat about emergency savings. 40% of Americans couldn't come up with $400 without borrowing or selling something, and 23% didn't have any emergency savings at all. That's a lot of households that were not doing well um, going into the pandemic, and it's it's important to say that for all of these indicators, um, that households of color uh, uh, did even worse. That the that that recovery served them even worse than the averages that you're seeing here, and we and that is also true for student debt. And we'll get into that. So this is the lens that we brought to um, to student debt when we when we got into the field. And if you could go to the next slide, please. And so after that grounding, what I want to talk about is a little bit of an overview of student debt challenges broadly and what they mean for households, and and how that drove the principles that we designed for coming up with student debt solutions. Um, the framework that we had for the state solutions, um, and then a, a, an overview of those solutions that we found. Uh, and if I can stay within time, which sometimes I'm able to, but sometimes I'm not, we'll, go, we'll spotlight a few particular solutions that we found in our analysis. Next slide, please. So this is the big picture on, on why student debt, right? Um, we kind of take a look at each issue of the uh, challenge that faces households and do a deep dive on, on how it affects families. And so we didn't start with student loan debt. We started with consumer debt as a whole. And the reason we're here is because if you can see that red bar or that red line growing and growing and growing, student loan debt over the past 15 years or so, um, the growth in it has vastly outpaced any other type of um, non-mortgage consumer debt um, in 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 the past growth in the past 15 years. Last year, it reached $1.5 trillion. Um, it's taken it to grow even more if we don't do anything about it. And so in aggregate, um, it's one of the most important uh, consumer debt challenges facing households right now. Next slide, please. This has deep implications um, for uh, the particulars of how people live their lives and their experiences of financial insecurity. There have been a lot of studies on the impacts that student debt has on kind of household financial security. Uh, it severely impacts short-term financial stability. So 58% of student uh, loan holders say that it's negatively impacted their credit score. 6% um, report that their wages or social security benefits have been garnished. I think this is a stat that comes up uh, and people are always surprised by. It's not just young people that hold student debt, right? That more and more people, older people are, are find themselves in, in large amounts of debt. And when that happens, they can have their social security wages garnished, which is not the system any of us imagined when we started to, to put student loan debt out there. It's also a big barrier to long-term financial security, which is something that we pay close attention to at the Aspen Institute. Um, in particular, we have a program on retirement savings, and there's been some study out of Boston College that those people who don't have student loan debt, controlling for age and income, have twice as much retirement savings as those with student loan debt. Now, there's a lot of associations wrapped up in there. Those folks might have been better off to begin with, but what's really interesting about that stat is that the amount of loans doesn't matter. It's about whether you have them. So even if you have the smallest amount of loans, it really impacts your ability to save for the future 
and therefore have a secure retirement or just build wealth as we and we'll talk about the um, wealth cap later as well. It affects career and life decisions. Um, nine out of 10 young people say that they want an employer that offers a student loan benefit. Um, and that's a huge number of workers who are clamoring for help with this and is an indicator of how much it, it hurts. Um, many of them also uh, say that, 53% um, say that it was a, a impacted how, what career decisions they made, right? So it, it affects our long-term trajectory, and then it also poses the risk to the larger economy. Um, people say that uh, it affects home ownership, so it affects the housing market, it affects whether people can buy uh, automobiles and take on those sorts of loans, right? So the ability to get around and get to work. I mean, it's gotten to the point where even past Fed shares have flagged that this could be a long-term drag on the economy if we don't deal with it. Next slide, please. So that's the, the kind of aggregate impact that uh, student loan debt is having. But I also think it's important to, to say that the typical borrower isn't the, the kind of stereotypical student that people think of. It's not necessarily someone who's going, getting a four-year degree that came right out of high school and just kind of goes through the process and gets a good job at the other end. There's a lot of complicated factors and a lot of different people who, get, who go to get degrees and therefore take on debt. 46% are first-generation students. 42% uh, are students of color. 24, like this is one in four students have dependents or children, right? These are parents going to school and taking on this debt. And in fact, they're more likely to take on larger amounts of debt than folks without. Um, I think it's important to know that one, these, these statistics are also a driver of um, how student loan debt disproportionately affects people of color, in particular black households. Um, uh, 21 percent of, of black borrowers are behind on their payments, 16 percent of Latinos compared to 6 percent of white borrowers. So the consequence of running a system, of running a student, uh, a, a higher education system built on debt has had a disproportionate effect on, on those households. Um, uh, next slide, please. The, the other piece that I want to flag here is that a lot of people have in their brains that student loan debt is primarily a problem for people with huge balances, that people take on all this huge debt and they can't get out of it. But actually, um, most of the problem, not all of the problem, and I would amend this slide if I were to do it again, most of the problem is with low balances. So if you look at the 66% of um, defaulters, um, are people with less than $10,000 in debt, as opposed to um, the people with who have large amounts of debt that people, people think about, right? Um, this, this, what's also true is that, uh, that that delinquency is concentrated among people who didn't complete a degree, which is why these small balancers are so important. Uh, if you got, went to school for a couple years, didn't, fund, didn't get to go the whole time, but took on debt to fund those amounts, you might have a small uh, amount of student debt, but relative, you didn't get the wage bump from actually getting the degree, right? And so you leave, you have this debt, even if it's small, you can't pay it off. So 54% of borrowers who are 31 days or more delinquent are people who didn't complete the degree. Um, and like some people want to say that, that they made that choice, right? But something I like to say is that in this situation, the higher education system has become a one strike and you're out system. If you went and you found out school wasn't good for you, but you, you paid for it with loans, you're very likely to have a, uh, have a lot of difficulty digging out of that and then having the career that you envisioned when you went to school in the first place. Next slide, please. So all of this data is kind of how we came to our principles of student debt solutions, and these are the core ones. Focused on financial security outcomes, that we want to be outcomes facing about households. Can they build up their long-term financial security? Can they get the jobs they want? Not, can they put food on the table and develop home ownership? Not just, are they delinquent on their loan or not? Like, we want to be long-term thinking. We want to build in data collection evaluation so that we know which of these solutions work and don't. We want to focus on people with those low balances that are more likely to be um, uh, in, in delinquency, uh, address the true circumstances of today's students, and particularly those disproportionately affected uh, by um, student loan debt, prioritize equity because we know that these loans disproportionately affect people of color 
and provide options for non-completers as a specific group. Like these, part of what we went into these solutions thinking was we ought to be specific to the people who have specific needs, not try to create magic bullet solutions that help everyone, right? Because those don't tailor to the people we're trying to help. Next slide. And so with that in mind, we took a, we took a step back and did a landscape of what, what are states up to as a, um, as a particular government institution in supporting, um, supporting borrowers and what are the options on the table for states. Um, and then we also interviewed a, a number of experts in the field, including Bridget, who is on the panel and will have in, important stuff to say later um, about kind of what, where, um, what are the most promising ones out there. Next slide. And so we focus our uh, solutions on the three cycles, uh, the si different cycles in which you kind of interact with debt. First, before you even take it on, can we reduce the out-of-pocket cost of attendance so you don't need to borrow as much? The second is when you have the debt, a lot of people don't kind of are, are confused by the programs, are confused by the servicing and how to interact with the system, particularly when they get into trouble and can't make their payments. And so how can we protect them as they navigate that debt? And then last, how can we decrease existing debt burdens on the back end and directly address folks who have taken on this debt already and are struggling with it? Um, and then blanketing over all of this is that these solutions should focus on low-income borrowers and borrowers of color for reasons that I went into earlier. Next slide. Um, so I'm getting a little short on time, so I'm just going to do the overviews, and then we can get into more specifics later in the Q&A if folks have questions. Uh, so for that front end section, how states can reduce out of pocket, uh, the out of pocket need for student debt. Um, we, we found, uh, six things that states are primarily doing. Need based aid and grant programs. So like direct scholarships and that sort of thing that just directly go to, um, to offset the cost of college. These have, the funding for this has decreased significantly over time on a per student basis. And so these have become less generous and are direct ways um, to to address the need. Uh, co free college programs, particularly for two-year institutions, have started to pick up in certain states. Uh, obviously, they interact with student debt in the same way that need-based aid does. Dual enrollment, enrollment programs um, allow folks to get credits at low or no cost early in the process so they can offset those costs. Um, and then four-year college, four college programs um, do a, have a similar role, right? Can you get a four-year degree uh, often at lower cost. Some mandatory FAFSA initiatives have some impact on the margin, uh, particularly in getting getting students into the system for getting student aid. Um, and then the last is, can we boost college saving account investments to help students save for post-secondary programs? The best versions of these that we found are folks are states that seed that money at the beginning and give everyone a, a, a pocket of money up front so that uh, everyone has access to some amount of fund, funds throughout the entire process. I wanna say here that like this is focused on states, but obviously the federal government plays a huge role. That's just wasn't, wasn't the focus on this report. Um, and so we try to include here a range of options that states with more funds or less funds could take advantage of depending on the situation. And obviously COVID has greatly um, slashed and affected state budgets. Right, and so all of this will have to be in the context of making sure that states have the funding they need to support families in the way, uh, in the ways they need it. Can we go forward two slides, please? So uh, how states can help navigate uh, uh, student debt that they already have. There are a couple things here. One is student loan servicing legislation and regulation. So servicers, for those who aren't familiar, are the folks who um, kind of do the communication and manage the back end of your loan. If you have a federal loan, that's on behalf of the Department of Education. And they're the ones who are in charge of getting you information and making sure that you understand the terms of your loan and the options you have. Um, many states have started increasing the requirements of those servicers to make sure people get the information they need. And if people don't get, get receive poor servicing, make sure they're protected if they made a, uh, they didn't make a mistake, but still had a servicing error. The second are re-enrollment programs. So these are programs that encourage non-completers, the folks who went to school for a couple years or didn't come back, um, to re-enroll and finish that degree. 
Um, I think it's really important to say in all these conversations that some of this problem is folks taking on too much debt, but some of it is them taking on not enough debt, right? That they, they take on debt for the first few years and then don't go back, take on that extra so they can actually get that degree and get uh, the wage bump associated with it when, when that works out. And so re-enrollment programs tackle that problem in particular. This has not been rolled out at the state level yet, but there are a couple universities who have, and it basically pays off some amount of um, the loans previously taken on as an incentive to come back to school and finish a degree. Can we go for two slides again? Um, and the last is kind of on the back end, um, how can we reduce uh, the amount of, of student debt that borrowers hold? Um, there are a, a number of ways to do this. I'll only highlight a few. Uh, the first are tax expenditures. So can you directly through tax credits or deductions help people pay their student debt? And some states have taken that on. Um, they work best, again, to the principles we talked about, when they, especially with limited state budgets, targeting that aid uh, to, to low-income students and uh, students disproportionately affected by student debt. Um, employer tax credits and deductions. So if you all recall um, that a lot of young workers are demanding these sorts of programs, but it's, it's starting and, and employers are starting to come along and offer these benefits, but not many. States have the option to provide this as an incentive to get more uh, employers to uh, offer these sorts of programs. This would obviously uh, help probably workers at larger employers first, and so wouldn't be the ideally suited to targeting folks at the bottom, but also it, it is useful to start um, widening these types of benefits so, so more and more students get them. It can become more, uh, or more borrowers can get them, and so it can be more acceptable for employers to offer this and standard and easy to, to offer. Um, the last thing um, I will flag is um, kind of sector-specific loan forgiveness and repayment programs. This is kind of a dual-purpose um, dual program that states often provide to give loan forgiveness and repayment to particular sectors when they need specific workers. Again, this is in the context of states having less money than the federal government to fund these things. So federal government has the capacity to do broader pay repayment and forgiveness. And uh, many states have chosen to, to offer as an incentive loan forgiveness for particular um, professions, such as teachers or people with certain skills. Next, uh, skip forward two slides, please. So that's kind of the broad overview. Uh, obviously trying to stay within time. Uh, couldn't, couldn't get into details on each of those, but our report has every, every, uh, every option has a section with design considerations and background for these, and we can go into more detail in the Q&A, depending on what folks are interested in. Great. Thank you so much, Tim. That was, that was really interesting. Um, yeah, so before we uh, turn the conversation over to Aurora, our next speaker, um, just another opportunity for, uh, for folks that are listening in to participate. Um, if you'd like to share with us um, what policy solutions your state is implementing to mitigate the impact of student loan debt during this time. Uh, please feel free to share that in the chat box. Uh, and when our speakers are done with their presentations, we can uh, return to those and, and, and share that with everyone. Um, next slide. So with that, uh, we will start our conversation about um, what's going on in Texas to address the student loan debt crisis uh, and our presenter is Aurora Harris, who's the Southern Regional Director at Young Invincibles in Texas. Aurora, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, next slide. That was a great intro. <laughs> <laughs> so we are gonna do a Texas Spotlight. I wanna thank you all so much for including us in this virtual space. And we're gonna talk about the great state of Texas. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit about some of those solutions that uh, Tim highlighted in his uh, research report as well. So I'm excited to see how it all kind of interconnects. Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna give you all a quick overview of the Texas student debt landscape. I'm gonna talk about um, student debt advocacy that our organization did in the 86th legislature. I'm gonna give you all a sneak peek of some uh, research that we are doing on our forthcoming student debt report that's gonna be released late September. 
Um, and I'm going to talk about some advocacy next steps that we're doing at uh, the state level here in Texas for the 87th legislature. Uh, next slide. All right, so Young Invincibles. Um, we're a nonprofit organization committed to elevating the voices of young people in the political process and expanding economic opportunity. So we are policy change and advocacy in organizing for young people by young people. We are um, proud avocado toast, TikTok, you know, Gen Z millennial folks. Um, and I'm really <laughs> excited to talk about uh, some of the advocacy work we've been doing about student debt in Texas. Uh, next slide. Um, so the way that we do our work at Young Invincibles is we do policy advocacy campaigns that incorporate our four main blocks of our theory of change. Um, and that's communications, um, policy that's young adult informed and led, engaging young activists on the ground, and then doing a lot of consumer education to young people. So letting them know about things like health insurance, literacy, and repaying back their loans, um, saving for retirement, those types of things that really help them sort of build the, the building blocks for their economic future. Those are the four ways that we kind of do our work, and I'll talk about how we incorporate those in our campaign. Uh, next slide. All right, so a little bit about Texas and our student debt burden at a glance. How did we get to this uh, debt for diploma system that we have right now? Um, so we've been seeing a reduction in public investment in Texas colleges and universities since 2000. Um, Texas dealt a real blow to young people in 2003 when they de deregulated tuition and allowed universities to set uh, tuition rates for themselves. Um, and of course, shortly thereafter, tuition rates um, went up and spiked. Um, and this has all led to a system where um, aid is now prioritized for folks who are attending uh, college and colleges and universities full time um, and who are sort of staying on campus. And like Tim illustrated before, that is overwhelmingly becoming less and less of what today's students are looking like. More and more of today's students are parenting children. They're going to two-year universities. They are first generation. Um, and so the aid system that we have right now in Texas isn't really prioritizing those folks. It's more prioritizing those traditional four-year students. And so a lot of students are being left out of aid and seeing increased tuition rates. And college is just really unaffordable for young people in our state. Uh, next slide. The good news um, is that um, we do have a um, large initiative out of the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board um, called the 60 by 30 plan. And this plan overall, overall is to make sure that 60% of Texans age 25 to 34 will have a certificate or degree by 2030. Um, so we're 10 years away of seeing where we met our goal. Um, within that goal is some completion goals, and it's goals around making sure young people have marketable skills when they leave um, the college or university or their uh, program. But there's also a goal around student debt, and that goal says that um, undergraduate student loan debt will not exceed 60% of your first, rear, first year wages for graduates of Texas public institutions. So your student loan debt should not exceed 60% of your first year wages. So. Drum roll, please. Let's see how Texas is doing. Next slide. <laughs> Who guessed not so great? You're right. <laughs> so Dominique Baker um, from Southern Methodist University actually has done a study on where we are at with our 60 by 30 goal with student debt in the state. She studied students from 2004 to 2008 and showed that most Texan students are earning about $34,000 a year during their first year after earning a degree meaning that the debt to income ratio is 74%. So we are not, not meeting our goal, our 60 by 30 goal right now. Not only are we not meeting that debt to income ratio goal, but students of color are more likely to borrow more, particularly black students are borrowing $7,214 more than their white counterparts. Latinx students are borrowing $453 more. Uh, next slide. Um, in addition to that, Texas um, holds the second highest student loan debt in the nation, alongside national trends that went along with the first recession millennials got hit with. Now we're in our second. Shout out to the millennials on the call for survivors. Um, the Texas, Texas student loan debt has increased by 70 billion since that time. Um, so now we're at 114 billion um, in student loan debt in Texas. 10% um, of borrowers are in default, and the average amount of student loan debt in Texas is close to $27,000. Next slide. 
So it's not looking so great. <laughs> um, in addition to, to those stats, and I, and I want to be clear, right, those stats are not just numbers. Those are like people and communities and families, right? Um, up until last session, Texas was kind of a dangerous place to have student debt. We actually had a law on the books that was carried over from, I think, the 80s that said, if you defaulted on your loan, you could lose your professional license. Um, and so what we had was folks who were defaulting on their loans already in poverty, already in a really you know tough place, um, were losing their professional license, right? Made absolutely no sense. Um, so bipartisan support emerged to repeal this law. It was called the right to work law because we are in Texas all about right, the right to work. Um, but we were really excited to be able to take part in this campaign to overturn this bill because you know it was really hurting a lot of folks, particularly folks who had their like CDLs or truck driving license, barbers, cosmetologists, things like that. So we launched a campaign with our partners at JOLT, um, their Latinx organizing group, and then Every Texan, they're a pretty progressive policy think tank here in Texas. And we launched a campaign to over overturn this um, last session. Next slide. So as I mentioned before, we are young adult led. Um, so we started with our Young Advocates program. These are organizers that we hire across the state to really help build out our campaign. Next slide. They um, did some story collection for us and um, collected stories on folks who were losing their professional license, and they really helped to uplift this bill um, within the media. Uh, next slide. Um, we are millennials, Gen Z, like I mentioned before. So we took to social media to talk a lot about um, this issue. We did student debt Twitter chats. We launched um, an advocacy page around the issue as well. Uh, next slide. Um, one exciting thing that our young advocates did was across the state, I think we did these in North Texas, Austin, Houston, and El Paso, um, we did student loan consumer education. Um, we built out, and the young people actually built out decks that actually taught young people about how to repay their loans in ways that actually made sense. Um, most young people that we talked to didn't even remember their entry and exit loan counseling, the words you know, maybe it didn't make sense at the time. You know, you're 17, 18 years old. You've never heard of any of these terms in your life, right? And so we built out some consumer loan, uh, excuse me, some consumer education around that. And then we also coupled them with a focus group um, to dive a bit deeper on what Texan students and borrowers were feeling and dealing with um, as a part of their student loan experience in Texas. And so that was a big part of our campaign as well. Uh, next slide. Um, and a really, really exciting thing that came out of our work was we developed a post-secondary advocates coalition. Um, and this is really a first sort of higher education coalition in Texas that is really about student voice and really places student voice at the center. We saw a lot of coalitions that were for institutions, um, but we really didn't see a coalition that was going to come to the Texas legislature with priorities that were student and borrower focused. Um, and so it started out with just Young Invincibles and Every Texan. It has now grown, I think, to more than 10 key organizations. Um, we were able to hold weekly member meetings during the session um, with select staff, um, really build out this coalition, and we have built it out ever since, and we're really excited to see how much it's grown. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so as a result of our advocacy work, proud to say um, that we won <laughs> the campaign. We've got to celebrate the wins. Um, and SB, 30, uh, SB 37 came and overturned um, that rule. And now we have another protection for student borrowers um, in Texas, and we're excited to build out even more protections. Uh, next slide. All right, so like I mentioned before, our young people were doing focus groups across the state. Um, with the student loan debt consumer education. So in addition to those focus groups, we also did a survey um, with over 1,500 um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color in Texas to talk a little bit about what their um, student loan debt experiences have been like um, to sort of continue to build on our work and really get an understanding of what the solutions could be in Texas and what do Texas young people need um, when it comes to this issue. Uh, next slide. Sneak peek, the report hasn't been uh, released yet, but what we found isn't surprising, I think, especially if you're in this space or especially if you have student loan debt or know people with student loan debt. Immense amount of mental and financial stress. I think that was something that we were not expecting, the amount of just mental health, I think, that comes along with carrying debt. 50% um, of borrowers across racial backgrounds felt worried or stressed about it. Um, 
definitely impacting future and planning goals like Tim mentioned earlier. And first generation students in particular really agreed that student loans impacted their ability to save for emergencies, their children's education, a home and retirement. Uh, next slide. In addition to that, we found that women had um, higher levels of stress regarding student loan payments and that 50% of borrowers across racial groups agreed or strongly agreed that they didn't have confidence in their knowledge of their repayment options. Uh, next slide. All right, so like to mention before, states are leading the way. Yes, we need the federal government to like abolish all debt, duh. But states are doing really cool work in the meantime. Uh, so we're gonna talk about what we wanna see next. Next slide. So in Texas, we are going to propose a student borrower bill of rights. That's one of the recommendations um, Tim kind of mentioned earlier. This is really looking at the relationship between loan servicers in the state and how can states better regulate what's happening with loan servicer companies and young people. Those are usually the first line that a young person has with their uh, loan is that servicer company. And so that relationship is really important. Um, and so we're looking forward to helping legislators have proactive solutions and preventative measures within that space. Um, and we're looking closely at the New Jersey bill and the California bill in particular to help inform the Texas bill. Uh, next slide. Um, some big necessities that came out of our data was this idea of a student loan ombudsman, someone who could look at servicer complaints um, and then also making sure that um, students have access and understanding of income-based repayment information. Because we heard that time and time again, both in our focus groups and when we did our presentations, as well as in the survey, that came up a lot of just really not understanding um, the repayment options. And of course, with the pandemic, you know, all student loan collections being halted, because um, that's such a huge marker of stress for, for young people in our state. Uh, next slide. Um, and then last but not least, we had uh, a data jam um, that was virtual, usually they're in person, but we had young people look at all the data that we had been collecting across the state. Um, and we asked them, you know, what else did we, didn't we not see? What are the solutions that need to be on the table? And I wanted to just show you all some of these solutions that they had. Um, of course, abolishing all student debt, duh, we have to say that. Um, but there are other things like um, student supports for DACA and undocumented students. Um, really taking a look at schools, regular uh, campus fees, um, increasing access to free textbooks, some of those out-of-pocket costs that a lot of people take on more debt to be able to afford that laptop, those books, those, you know, all of those different things. How can we sort of mitigate some of that? Um, and so, yeah, so I wanted to kind of present those and, and show that these are the other options that young people are coming up with that we're hoping to include in our report. Um, and that's it for me. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you all so much. Uh, next steps is that we're going to continue our data analysis and policy recommendations and our report's going to come out late September. Um, we are going to release that report to policymakers and push for a borrow bill of rights here in Texas, as well as other um, legislation around completion, supports, need-based aid that Tim was talking about earlier. And we're going to keep up in touch with all of you for um, future advocacy opportunities. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Aurora. That's great. Um, next slide. Uh, so last but certainly no, not least, we have Bridget Tate, who's the Director of National Programs at the Financial Clinic, uh, and she's going to present um, issues related to the institutional role when it comes to student loan debt. I think we might... Oh, she... Bridget, I... oh, there you go. Um, Yeah, is Bridget, can, are you unmuted by chance? Um, oh yeah, it sounds like we, okay. Uh, there we the are, light. thank you, Bridget. <laughs> live virtual paneling. This is what yeah. happens with live webcasts, it's all good. <laughs> if there wasn't something a little wrong. Thank you so much, Andrew, for the introduction. And I especially wanna thank Prosperity Now and um, for this invitation to be on this panel. We're super excited about it and want to share all of the good work that we have done over the last few years in regards to this space. Next slide. Next. There you go. All right. 
So um, I just want to tell you a little bit about the Financial Clinic and who we are. Um, the Financial Clinic is a national nonprofit organization that builds financial security for low-income households. We do this through a combination of capacity building, direct service, research, and policy work. And we do all of this great work on our platform called Change Machine. And Change Machine is our vehicle to scale the work that we do. So I'm gonna to talk to you all today about a couple of projects that we have been involved in over the last two years, hence the t-shirt, Project 44 Billion. <laughs> and that's with all of the student loan debt that is held in the state of North Carolina. There are over 1.2 million North Carolinians alone that hold 44 billion in student loan debt. And I want to just give a little quote from our CEO and founder of the financial clinic, um, Mae Watson. And the rapidly growing student loan crisis is not only a threat to the financial security of North Carolinians as individuals, but also to the wealth of marginalized communities for generations to come. And again, that is a quote from Mae Watson. Next slide. So I also want to thank the other panelists who really set me up for um, this conversation moving forward. Tim alluded to quite a bit of things that we'll be talking about in the direct approach that we're taking as far as our responsibility in direct service and partnering with universities and colleges in North Carolina. We initially rolled out an ecosystem in 2018 and had a partnership with the local community college where we were able to provide a financial coach on campus. We integrated financial securities and coaching through new student orientation to graduating students excellent exit counseling. And for all first year students that are required to take an academic success class that they delve into their SMART goals, they have added financial future debt in regards to student loan debt as one of those goals. This sustainability of this project was amazing. Because of the work that we did on campus, that particular college was able to fundraise for a permanent coach on campus. And that coach is continuing to use our platform, Change Machine, to collect effective data that continues to inform our next steps. Next slide. In that engagement, we were able to coach over 699 students in one-on-one -on -one coaching. We addressed not only their future plans in regards to their student loan debt, but as much as to what Tim was sharing with us is that we understood and, and, and completely recognized that this is a holistic approach, that in order for students to feel able to look towards financial future goals, they first have to discuss and identify their current financial situations, and a lot of that was consumer debt. This would set them up for success as they went on to plan for their future and make transitions into higher education and universities. We were able to reduce 45% of reduced consumer debt with students on campus and faculty, I might add. This opportunity was also extended to faculty. And we were able to help them increase their credit scores by 39%. These early interventions and conversations with students set them up, much like Aurora said, for better financial choices moving forward and understanding interest rates and how to manage that student debt. Due to the success of that particular ecosystem, next slide. We began a project in 2019 called, called College Works, and I should have put hashtag because you can't have a great project and not have a great hashtag. So again, that's hashtag 44 billion. And with generous support from the Annie E. Casey Foundation, we launched this three-pronged pilot initiative to support students at Durham Technical Community College. So while we were, they were able to fundraise for a coach that now sits on campus to this day, we were able to move to the next level. And what we did in this instance is we have a expert financial coach that is an expert in student loan debt and navigating servicers and opportunities. And what we provided then to, the, to this college was 
a student loan coach that works solely with students to navigate their student loan um, debt. How we reached those students was through the cohort default list. And I don't know if many of you know, but the cohort default list is sent to all universities and colleges each month with any delinquencies or defaults of students that are um, no longer enrolled in school. And universities and colleges do not have to do anything with that list. It just comes every month unless they fall under 30% of default rate. Then they must have a corrective action plan in order to bring that default rate below that 30%. The financial aid office at Durham Tech, I, I have to say Durham Tech is not at a financial default rate, but they wanted to be proactive. And again, with the momentum of the project that we had worked on prior, they partnered with us and were, became committed to helping students get their loans current and get out of default. And so what they now do, present date, is they send out a monthly outreach letter to over, I think the number exceeds 800 at this time, to these students and offer them the opportunity to connect with our student loan coach. And as we're momentum is building and these things are going out and we're engaged, COVID hit. And what happened during that time because of the CARES Act is that with the pause in the moratorium on student loans, students seem to be less engaged and really wanted to talk about the student loan debt and <clears throat> repayment plans and getting out of delinquency. But what we did find is that students were now in a position um, to talk about their consumer debt. And that what that said to us as an organization is that when people are boggled down with debt, there's a scarcity in how they're going to um, remedy it, how they're going to pay it. A lot of times it's that fight or flight, pull, you know, pull the covers over your head. But because of the moratorium, they were in a better position to think through their consumer debt and get a solid plan moving forward. And so these are some of the takeaways that we were able to identify early on in this moratorium and how it speaks to post-COVID resources that will need to be in place to continue to mitigate that scarcity for people to be able to navigate their debt. We've also engaged local universities. And because we know, based on all the statistics that Aspen has provided us and all the great research that's been done in this field, we know that Black students suffer a higher debt costs. So because there are 12 HBCUs in North Carolina, and that's where we're going to find our Black students, we made a conscientious effort to partner with local universities. We're currently working with North Carolina Central University and their Justice Department. Their Justice Department has a network of the other HBCUs where we're able to hold workshops and disseminate information and provide coaching to HBCU students at no cost. Next slide. During this engagement and during this COVID and all, we were still able to reach 820 students to help them navigate their debt and provide access to a financial coach. We did this through various options to Aurora's point and also to Tim's. The H um, Barry, but there, so we had to be um, creative and um, deliberate in how we did our outreach. So we used email outreach, phone calls, social media, and online workshops. Because at the end of the day, our responsibility is to meet customers where they're at. We were able to engage one-on-one -on -one with 188 students. They received coaching. And we did this through virtual coaching sessions and Zoom webinars. We also reached out to the anchors in our community specific to Black communities. And those were the local churches and radio ads, um, the gospel station radio ad, um, so that we could reach out and make sure that we were disseminating this information in a way to create opportunity and access for all. 10% of the students coached entered a repayment plan. And again, this all kind of took place during COVID. But what our coach was able to do for those who potentially were not ready to do an enter a repayment plan was to really talk about the repayment plan. 
you know, they have the um, income driven repayment plan, which always looks really good. Five dollars a month to pay down the debt, but nobody's talking about the interest. And now because there is no interest compounding, we're able to hold workshops of understanding on how interest works with student loan debt and the importance of tackling that principle balance. Next slide. So these are some of our takeaways and solutions that have been funneled up. We believe that ending garnishments of public student loan debt is an effective solution. Student debt moratoriums for private student loan debt. Empowering the financial aid office to provide proactive financial coaching and cohort default outreach. And of course, direct services, which would be one-on-one -on -one student loan coaching. There are some bad actors in here and, and they're called servicers, um, if I'm just gonna name them. And in navigating the debt and getting on the phone with servicers, it really, um, having been in this arena for so long, I, student loan debt and the housing crisis are two of the same from where I sit. I remember people trying to navigate um, modifications and reaching out to lenders. And we had to do a whole change of events in order for us to get to solutions. And what we have noticed in regards to some servicers, not all, but just getting through that first phone call creates barriers and frictions that keep people from looking for solutions. So I support Aurora, you mentioned an ombudsman, somebody who has no skin in the game in the sense other than to reach a solution. And we have effectively done that with one-on-one -on -one student coaching. That is your first contact and that person will walk through this process with you until you get to the end of resolution and resolving that student loan debt. The impact of student loan debt on home ownership um, is it, the, the fact that we're told to go to school, buy a house, and I'm talking specific as in regards to the racial wealth gap, that these are areas that will allow us to gain some type of financial mobility, but student loan debt is keeping people from even doing that. And that's continuing to widen that racial wealth gap. In closing, I would like to tell you all what our next steps are. We'll be going through 2020, 2021, and we're going to move towards working directly with the HBCUs, providing student loan coaching, empowering the financial aid office to be proactive and send out cohort list. But equally as important is we're hearing from the students what resolution looks like for them. And you guys can stay tuned for that at the summit, the Virtual um, Prosperity Now Summit. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Bridget. And before we um, proceed, I did want to say um, Tim Shaw's official title is the Senior Policy Manager at the uh, at the Aspen Institute in the Financial Security Program. Um, I gave the titles for our other two speakers, but we, uh, as what sometimes happens with live webcasts, we we somehow skip the the speaker slide. So Tim, you are officially presented to the audience. <laughs> Um, with that I said, uh, I just wanted to remind you that, you know, this is the opportunity now that they've all uh, presented their, um, you know, discussed various elements of, of student loan debt from their, from their sight lines uh, for you folks to participate. Uh, once again, um, please share any, any questions you may have or any observations as well in the chat box. Um, while our speaker, speakers were talking, we did get a few comments as well as a few questions. And I think um, one of the questions does go to this issue of COVID. Um, so one of our audience members said that they have noticed that there are, you know, increased forbearances, increased deferments right now, there's um, increased collections. Um, these are all the result of, of COVID that they basically spiked. Um, and so that sort of comes to the issue of, you know, in a general sense, you know, how do you feel, um, what are the biggest accelerators with COVID-19 in terms of student loan debt? Um, 
And has the CARES Act helped at all, um, you know, from your perspective? Uh, Tim, why don't we start with you? What do you think about the impact of COVID? Sure. Um, I'll say broadly that I think people need money right now. Like, I, I don't, I don't want to sugarcoat it, right? That people don't have jobs. Those jobs have been lost primarily for people who are um, on the lower end of the income spectrum and also for workers of color, uh, particularly black workers. They're more likely uh, to be kind of frontline workers at risk for COVID-19, right? The, the biggest thing that Congress in particular can do for um, people affected by student loan debt right now is to uh, uh, push along the extension of the UI enhancement and also get another check out the door. Um, so that's thing one. Uh, on, the, on the issue of student loan debt in particular, um, the CARES Act did create a moratorium on student loan payments and uh, reduced the interest to zero. That has been extended to the end of the year by the administration. Um, and so that that relief continues and it's worked. Like we're seeing a reduction in delinquencies right now. I think I worry about what happens when it ends, right? Primarily for this particular thing that it won't be on people's minds. They will like, they will have gone, I don't know, 10 months without having to make a student loan debt payment and then it'll come right back, right? And so what I'm worried about from the household perspective are the like debt overhangs and more people getting into a position where they're delinquent or default on their loans and enter that kind of cycle of debt um, in the longer term. Um, I think in the context of the wealth gap and other things going on, uh, if we look back to the last, last recession to now, um, the bottom 50% of wealth holders in the country um, regained the amount of wealth, that is assets and debt put together, regained the wealth they had lost during the Great Recession the year before COVID hit. And then it all kind of went away again, right? So like, we, we need to be thinking about this more proactively and more aggressively so that when, after this, uh, folks who are struggling with debt broadly and student debt in particular aren't left in that hole again after this recession. Great, how about yeah. Aurora and Bridget, your thoughts on, on COVID? Yeah, I would just echo um, what Tim mentioned. Um, and then, you know, for us in our demographic, uh, we had large members of our base effectively shut out of uh, the Initial Cares um, Act anyway. I a lot of uh, dependents who were over a certain age um, weren't even eligible for uh, the meager uh, $1,200 or $500 um, that was in that, as well as folks from mixed immigrant status backgrounds as well. Um, so they were kind of effectively shut out um, from that anyway. Um, and so we would love to see something like that in the next um, go rounds of conversations. And I know they left um, millions of Americans without even having that conversation, which is a whole other thing. Um, but I, def I effectively agree. I think the the moratorium was was great, but what happens when um, it lifts and you know we're left with the debt burden that we had before, and then we don't know the folks' financial situations of what they will be in and whether or not they'll even be able to pay. Um, so I think we need to be proactive, we need to be aggressive, and we really need to be thinking about this from a racial wealth gap perspective and what do communities of color really need um, to not just survive COVID, but get back to, to thriving, um, is what I would say. Great. Um, I, I absolutely agree with all that said. I think it's specific to the CARES Act as it relates to student loan debt. My biggest, the moratorium is awesome, right? Like nobody can say that that's not, we're not, no interest, nothing's compounding, the balances are gonna be the same when they get back. My concern and fear as a practitioner and direct service is are we disseminating enough information to those that are currently not making these payments for them to then begin to address, say their consumer debt, right? Um, are they able to save during this time in order to bridge some of those um, mm -hmm. insecurities that they had prior to this? And indicative to the black community having been hit the hardest by COVID, that we already know that there's other things that are going to compound this when the debt comes back. Um, so it's just a matter of, are we bridging the gap in the information in a way that's gonna be successful? I also do think that um, the moratorium speaks to how life is very secular anyway, and we are doing um, crisis coaching protocols at this time. And people will have highs and lows, but these moratoriums could be reflective individually 
and not just nationally. And I think that's something that we really need to take a look at in a legislative manner um, to help people meet people where they're at post COVID because they were already in crisis, right? So, you know what I mean? Like, so yeah, we need some other barriers and roadblocks up. Gotcha. Um, so there's also another question uh, from one of our uh, participants that talks about, and this, this was discussed to, to a degree during the, the presentations, um, do you foresee that employers are going to offer to pay off student loans to uh, recruit and retain employees? Do you think that's going to become more of a trend in the future? Uh, because you know, if they're looking to you know recruit talents, you know, this would be one one way to do it. Do you, do you know if there's an appetite for these types of policies at this stage? Anyone who would like to to hop in? Yeah, I can take that. So 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 some of our work with um, retirement benefits providers, I think we, we are starting to see, like and th those folks uh, work with employer benefits generally, we are starting to see a lot more interest in providing student loan debt benefits. Um, and some more major employers are starting to roll these sorts of things out. So, so yes, I do think we're going to see more of it, um, particularly as younger, talented workers demand those sorts of programs. Again, what I'll reiterate is that, like, that I think that's great, but I also don't think it'll reach the people who need it most, the fastest, right? So we need an all of the above approach, and that's one thing. Um, and, and we need, but we need more additional solutions. Another kind of innovative thing that some employers are doing with student loan um, benefits that link the kind of longer-term financial security outcomes with shorter with the the debt issues is to allow for a payment towards a student loan to count towards um, your retirement match. Yeah. Right. So if you pay five percent of your income towards a student loan, the employer will still put their retirement match into your account. That's a low cost way of employers to kind of allow, like incentivize people to pay off their loans more and give them a financial benefit out of it and build up longer term financial security. So like there, there are interesting things happening. And what we're looking for is kind of them to, to become more and more uh, ubiquitous among employers. Gotcha. Um, so we actually also got some responses from folks about things that they are doing in their state uh, to address student loan debt issues. Uh, so, for example, in North Carolina, there is a grant called the Finish Line. Um, this helps people pay unexpected ex expenses to help them complete their degree. Um, someone also chimed in that in Michigan, they've got zero interest payments with no accruals. Um, and I think this is another issue that uh, we did want to touch on a bit, it, it, which is, you know, these are state solutions. You've talked about, you know, the, the role of the federal and the role of the state. You know, what do you sense in terms of the appetite at the federal level and the state level to actually make changes that would address student loan debt? You know, is there interest? Is there more interest on one side versus the other? Um, Bridget, Tim, Aurora, anyone interested in thinking about the, uh, you know, that, that tension between state and federal? Um, I will say that I definitely think that there is an appetite to address it here in Texas. It's a part of our 60 by 30 plan that I outlined earlier. I do, I do think the issue in Texas though is, um, uh, it's just harder, and especially now with the revenue shortfall that we're gonna be having, it's harder to get things past that have any kind of fiscal note um even before covid so even now with the revenue shortfall i think something like that's going to be incredibly difficult but i do think that there is an appetite i will say in texas and it's a part of our larger 60 by 30 goal to address student debt um, um we do sometimes get that from legislators so that's federal and most people have federal debt but i i definitely think since we included it in that larger strategy that there is an appetite for it here and i don't know bridget and tim if y'all have any feedback there um, if not, I actually have a question that came in that I think, Bridget, would be uh, is really directed at you. The question is, can you speak more on credit affected by student loan debt? Many of my clients have the debt, have debt impacting their credit negatively due to this being placed in collections because of non-payment. What solutions do you think can be implemented in regards to this? Um, yeah, definitely speak about that. Um, so, Student loan debt, it doesn't go away, 
can't file bankruptcy on it. Um, it's there forever. It impedes you getting any access mm -hmm. to any federal funding moving forward. And the first thing that comes to mind is the FHA loan, which many Americans use. It's the most low cost loan with the lowest down payment, but you cannot even get an FHA loan if you've defaulted on your student loan debt. So those are ways that they impact you. If you're delinquent and or in default, it's going to pull down your score. That's a direct impact. If your score is pulled down, rental options become less because a lot of that is done by scores, as well as employers. Employers in some states pull your credit. So we need to begin to look at student loan debt, much like we looked at defaulted mortgages when we were in the housing crisis and post it as far as solutions. In that arena at that time, if you had a foreclosure, you couldn't buy a house for years. But because they understood, the government understood that you would knock out a whole sector of people and revenue into the economy, they flipped that. Two years, take a class, come see a coach, and you can buy a house again. And we need to begin looking at student loan just like that. And it's unfortunate because it's when it begins to touch the 1% is when those changes will happen. But I challenge all of us to be proactive and understand if we can start with the marginalized, everybody wins at the end of the day. Excellent. Um, we have another question that's very specific about the CARES Act. Um, it's a little weedy, but it basically is, do you think it's likely that tax advantage for employer paid student loan, student loans, that was put in place by the CARES Act will be extended past 2020. Um, Tim, any thoughts? Not to put you on the uh, I, I think it. I think it's possible. It's a relatively low cost way to to address um, student loans in the in the tax code. I, so I, I think um, to kind of one of the earlier questions on whether there's going to be a federal appetite to address student loans. I think it could be right in, in part because. I don't know what what you all have seen at your respective institutions, but what I, what we found is that when we comment on or do presentations on student debt and student debt cancellation in particular, which is a, another body of work we have for federal policy, we get a lot of views and a lot of people are very interested in it. It's one of the most engaging topics that people see, and I think people in Congress are seeing too. Now the question is, when the the wheels of Congress turn, um, it's going to be up against a bunch of different um, priorities, right? And if you recall when someone asked what I would do about student debt, my first answer was about unemployment insurance, not student loan debt in, in specifics, right? So, so we're going to have a bunch of competing priorities when time comes for action, but I think it'll be on the table because I think it's affecting so many, so many people. Mm. Um. Another question um, is about the student loan forgiveness program. Someone wants to know why is higher education excluded from the student loan forgiveness programs offered for K through 12? And if you don't know, that's okay. We can, we can try to find out the information. I don't know if anyone knows the specifics on that one. Not familiar with the K-12. Yeah, um, no worries. We will see what we can find. Um, I, I, I have a question where someone wanted to know more about how exactly um, student loan debts impacts home ownership. Um, Aurora, Bridget, would you guys like to hop in on that one? Credit or debt is for home ownership is based on DTIs. So that's your debt to income ratios. Student loan debt is the highest debt post um, mortgages. And so therefore you're already carrying 30 to $100,000 worth of debt in student loan debt. The average worker that's even potentially making 60,000, their DTIs, including consumer debt, it's gonna be too high. But again, in the housing crisis, we change DTIs in order for people to be able to purchase homes. So there is a solution there for that. Gotcha. Um, great. Uh, there's also a question on, someone said, I recently submitted my employment certification form that I do every year. The response that always follows is the updated number of payments counted toward my 
PSLF 120 payments. My last three months that were in the CARES Act suspension were not counted. I thought they were supposed to count. Bridget, they, you look like you. Yeah, I, I forgot to mention that. Um, so they they are supposed to count. Please call my financial coach that is doing the work. <laughs> and she will get through that with you. But the, when we talked about resolutions that the CARES Act should carry over, what they're doing now is you make 10, you know, you make 12, 12 years, 10 years consecutive payments with no fault. You had to keep the payments going. That's how it's always been designed. The CARES Act says, okay, we're pausing. Don't make a payment. You're good. You can pick it up when we unpause. That's something that needs to carry over because again, life has crises for individuals. So somebody who's on their ninth payment and unfortunately loses a job, you're gonna now tell me all those payments don't matter because I didn't do them consecutively. I say no. I say that the same pause we're doing now is a pause we need to do post. But please reach out to us. Our information is there. My coach will navigate that with you. I, I absolutely okay. agree. Um, Oh, God. I'm just, yeah, go no, forward. I was going to say that's why you had so many people who were trying to, you know, cash in on their PSLF and then were like, what's happening? I didn't do X, Y, and Z correct. And now we have so few people who've actually been successful in public service loan forgiveness. I absolutely agree that that's something that needs to carry over. Great. Um, uh, one other question. Uh, the student loan program forbearance program has a limited time it can be used. Will the COVID forbearance be counted against that timeline? Again, that's another weed question. No? Ah, okay. <laughs> um, let's see. There is another observation on Fanny and Freddie. Bear with me one second. Uh, Yeah, it would be great to have some advocacy with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and how they view student loans for mortgage qualification. Um, I guess in a general sense, what are your feelings about Fannie and Freddie, uh, you know, either, you know, outside of COVID, considering COVID, um, anything you think they should be doing that they're not doing, anything they're doing well? Um, not as, not, I'm, you guys, I don't mean to hijack. Oh, <laughs> please weigh in. I apologize. Um, Fannie and Freddie, not as it relates to student loan debt, but I think to the to the ask of the question, um, having come out of conservatory, I think Fannie and Freddie are in a place that, you know, they potentially can do some things in regards to lending practices um, and looking at DTI in a different way. But I will give them a thumbs up just for anybody out there who knows anybody in housing and securities. There is a tool that you can look up from Fannie and Freddie. Um, to identify whether or not your property is owned by them, if you're a homeowner, and if you're a renter, if the property is owned by Fannie and Freddie, they have been granted forbearances, and that will trickle down to the consumer. So, there you go. Gotcha. Excellent. Um, we do have some, we do, we do have like a number of questions that are also rolling in. This is great. I'm glad people are very engaged. This one is about counseling sessions. Um, someone wants to know, are students advised to earn degrees that will allow them to earn enough money to pay the debts? And that's that's kind of a, I mean, that's an interesting question. I remember hearing something in Australia about how they were going to start, if people want to get a STEM degree, they're going to actually lower their tuition costs. Uh, but yeah, how about, what do you think about that? Should, you know, should they, are students being advised to earn degrees that will allow them to earn money to pay debts? I can speak to the relationship with Durham Tech. Um, the first year students do SMART goals. And part of that SMART goal is thinking about what you want your degree in, what is the cost of that degree, and what is the return on investment in regards to the cost of that degree. So we have helped them to integrate that on campus from a cost perspective. Gotcha. This one is, uh, I think you, you, you will each have something to say about this one. Um, what are your thoughts on private loans? and the expense of these degrees that are offered at double the cost. Tim, how about you? Any thoughts? Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, so private loans and, and kind of the, 
a system that gets people in, particularly to programs that aren't going to pay off at the other end of the degree, are are a are an important driver of um, sort of student loan crisis. We haven't didn't get into this in the presentation, um, but outcomes for folks who went to certain private um, online institutions in particular are not nearly as good and don't pay off in the same way. And sometimes those institutions are linked to kind of private loans. I think one of the one of the key policy questions is a lot of the solutions we talk about are things that the federal government can do because they own the loan. But as soon as it takes that next step into the private space, that's a whole nother set of needed regulations and discussions that need to happen. Um, and, and Bridget's talked about doing some of this great work. I just think it's really important that universities also pay attention to how their programs are getting funded um, and have some level of accountability for um, how their, stu their students' financial outcomes afterwards. Um, there's a, a, another program that I don't work with at the Aspen Institute called the College Excellence Program that works directly with colleges um, and their senior um, administrative staff and presidents about how, like, about thinking about that next step and thinking again from a financial outcomes perspective for students. Um, and that, that's, a, that's a link that needs to be built that isn't natural, right? Like when a student graduates, and I don't think it's natural to think that there's still your responsibility, but, you know, folks gave them the degree. Right, and those degrees are are sold as a way to get a better job and more income, and so that should be an outcome that universities measure as well. Excellent, Aurora. Did you want to uh, add anything to that, or? Yeah, I would just say just from an advocacy perspective, it's it makes our job tougher, right? Because that's Tim's point. Um, it's easy. It's easier to just do systems change work when it's the federal government or a state entity that holds the loan. Um, and so we did do some advocacy for the attorney general to at least try to halt payments um, on private for private loan borrowers because we were trying to figure out once COVID hit what can we do for folks who have private loans. Um, definitely agree. More work needs to be done on the front end so that young people are not taking out those loans in the first place. Excellent. Uh, so and this is uh, the last question that we have uh, before we wrap up. It is with the low acceptance rate of the public service loan forgiveness. Um, is this a viable option for graduating students? And are there any success stories with this program or any tips that could be shared with the audience? Any thoughts? <laughs> I think the no? collective look at this is the answer. <laughs> Tim, I'll, I'll let you go. It looks like you were going to go. Yeah, and if not, I will say to our, to, I'll see if we can find something for you because, yeah, we'll, it's it's good to know if there's some some tips there. Uh, I'll say, I, so I don't I don't work directly with um, borrowers, and so I'm not. We don't work as a direct service. So I'll, I'll let others. If if Bridget has more to say on this, um, I'll, I'll let her take it. I do think that it's viable. I think it also is a maze and intentionally set up for a way where you have to jump through hoops to the point that you get frustrated. Um, and I think to um, Aurora's point about an ombudsman, to mine about a coach, somebody to navigate, it should just be part of the system. We cannot rely on the servicer to do it for you. You need somebody who has your best interests at heart. Um, so yeah, I think that it is. it has great potential if it worked, but it's broken. It's a little broken right now. Gotcha. If I can if I can add one thing on top of that from a policy perspective is that income driven repayment programs and public student loan forgiveness, they're all supposed to be forgiven at the end of a certain period, right? But it's not just on servicers and coaches and that sort of thing. Like the Department of Education and Congress needs to simplify these programs so that it's easier to navigate, period, right? One thing is needing help to get through a complex system, and one, another is setting up a complex system in the first place, right? And we need both. So it's not just on coaches and individuals, it's also on the federal government to get their house in order and make sure that when you enter these programs, they work the way they're supposed to for you. And, and Tim, can I ask you, um, I know you've got a couple of additional reports. I don't know, um, if you mind saying what those reports are, and also is Aspen, is, does, do you have a storehouse of what each state is doing right now with student loan debt, or perhaps know of a place where that information is being resourced? So I don't know of a, of a storehouse. So um, 
I can't help that though our our report has a, a number of more examples specifically about kind of what states are up to. Um, so we have our state solu uh, solutions to student debt report. We also have a making the case about student debt and kind of broad principles for any level of policy, um, any level of government trying to make policies to address student loan debt and employers and the private sector. We also have a report from a couple years ago on the, uh, kind of scoring the cost of the various um, repayment and cancellation proposals at the federal level. So if folks want to see what the options are that range from full forgiveness to um, kind of restructuring and simplifying those um, income driven repayment systems, we have that report out there. And then by the end of the year, we'll also be republishing a brief on uh, what philanthropy can do to address the student debt crisis. So be on the lookout for that as well. Um, and I, that's that's amazing. And I just wanted to lift up one, one resource because um, you mentioned about not having the repository. There is a state student loan debt advocacy working group that's hosted by the Center for Responsible Lending. Um, and so if folks are on the call and they're advocates at the state level and want to be involved in that work, um, we'll be talking a lot about Tim's reports, I'm sure, <laughs> in that working group. Um, that the Center for Responsible Lending does host that um, every month. Excellent. Well, I just want to thank all our speakers. This is a really robust conversation. You guys did a great job. I really appreciate you sharing all of your insights. Um, with that, I just wanted to say, uh, uh, you know, thank you everyone for participating. Um, Prosperity Now has a number of resources, including if you go to prosperitynow.org slash get involved, um, you can sign up to one of our uh, number of networks. Um, we would also suggest that you uh, go to Prosperity Now Take Action um, and sign up for one of our advocacy centers or one of our campaigns. Uh, this will actually allow you also to, uh, to get information on, on bills that are moving on the Hill uh, that are, uh, will be of interest to you and would also give you some pointers as to uh, as to how to um, actually contact members of Congress or actually get involved to try to, to move policy in the right direction. Uh, so again, thank you all so much for a great conversation uh, and have a great afternoon. Thank you.